This week on the A Push Show, we look at Chapter 15, Reconstruction and the New South. We look at the problems of peacemaking. There was just a civil war. Would the United States be able to keep the peace, or would kind of another war break out? We'll look at radical reconstruction. Whoa, was it really radical, or was it just kind of radical, like the bad kind of radical that we often hear in the news today? We'll look at the South in reconstruction. How would they handle their reconstruction? Would they be reconstructed with a firm foundation, or would they be kind of broken and bent and kind of fall apart for another eight? years. We'll look at the Grant administration. Did he grant a lot of stuff or did he not grant a lot of stuff? Hmm, I guess we'll see what he granted. And we'll look at the abandonment of Reconstruction. Hmm, I wonder if it felt abandoned and sad or if it felt independent and free. And we'll look at the New South. Was it really new or was it just kind of like the Old South? All this and more this week on The A Push Show. chapter much like how we began the last two chapters, with a large degree of uncertainty for the future of the nation. Americans were uncertain as to how the United States would function after a massive civil war in which the North and South saw a combined 618,000 people die over the issue of the South's practice of enslaving all members of the African American race. As the civil war began to wind towards its exhausting conclusion, there were still no clear paths on what to do to repair a nation that had been fractured by civil war. How do you readmit nearly half of the country that chose war over unity? I mean, I'm all for forgive and forget, but in my experience, the former is far easier than the latter. As one can imagine, the war was nothing short of a catastrophe for the South. The devastated South lost over 20% of its white male population, and thousands more were wounded or sick. Many Southern women engaged in a cult-like devotion to the deceased as they would wear dark clothing and jewelry in mourning for two years following the war's end. In addition to the loss of life, many Southerners also lost nearly all of their wealth as countless towns, farms, fields, bridges, and railroads would be destroyed in the course of the war. Southerners would experience further hardship as all money invested in Confederate war bonds and slavery would be lost. From the ashes of the South, the decimated population would have to rebuild itself. Out of this devastation and overall spirit of mourning, a romanticization of the Southern lost cause would emerge. This was a belief in the idea that the Southern way of life before the war was some sort of idyllic paradise, and that all those who fought and served the Confederacy were to be venerated for generations to come. Men like Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, P.G.T. Beauregard, and several other Confederate soldiers would be exalted to nearly divine status as countless monuments and memorials memorials would be erected throughout the South in their honor, regardless of the fact that they lost and that they were fighting for the right to keep people under a brutal system of slavery based on their race. But the most poorly off in the South after the war were, of course, African Americans who may have won freedom but scarcely won much of anything else. As blacks left plantations and Confederate military camps by the thousands, they would travel throughout the South looking for relatives or a place to live. Many had scarcely more than the clothes on their back as they would have no land, few tools, no education, and few prospects. The whole of the South had been devastated, but the same hierarchy that existed before the war remained largely intact. Above all else, Southerners would rally behind the cause of freedom, but that definition of freedom was very different depending on how wealthy you were as well as the color of your skin. For African Americans freed from bondage, freedom wasn't simply the release from the system of slavery. It also meant receiving the same opportunities and rights that all American citizens exercised. As one African American put it, if I cannot do like a white man, I am not free. Other African Americans would go further as they would advocate that they should receive economic resources in the form of wealth redistribution, which actually makes sense considering that they had been robbed of all the fruits of their labor for the previous 200 150 plus years. 
With emancipation, many blacks immediately withdrew from white societies and began to establish their own communities with mutual aid organizations, churches, and in some cases, their own schools. In Galveston, Texas, African Americans would establish a holiday known as Juneteenth to commemorate the emancipation of African Americans in the state of Texas in 1865, nearly a year and a half after the Emancipation Proclamation. To this day, Juneteenth is the celebration of African American independence throughout the United States. But for white Southerners, freedom meant something entirely different. Freedom meant the ability to freely continue systems of racial oppression and exploitation that they had been conducting for generations. Freedom meant the ability to ignore the mandates of the 13th Amendment, to engage in new systems of racial exploitation that provided virtually the same benefits and social structures that had existed before the Civil War. In the United States, we love to throw around the word freedom, but rarely do we ask what it means. Free to do what? What? The Declaration of Independence said we are born with the right to liberty, but the liberty to do what exactly? It's a question we must ask ourselves as we examine various American struggles for freedom. Do people want to be free from oppression, or do they want to be free to oppress? Taft here wants freedom, but only the freedom to oppress birds of their right to be living creatures. In order to try and establish some semblance of order and opportunity for the new society of the South, Congress would establish the Freedmen's Bureau of March of 1865. With federal troops still stationed in the South, the Bureau would provide aid for blacks as well as education and some opportunities for land acquisition. There was also some aid given to poor destitute whites as well. But the Freedmen's Bureau ultimately had very limited impact as it would only last a year and was entirely too small to assist the multitudes of struggling Southerners, white or black. What made Reconstruction such an uncertain prospect was the fact that Congress was unable to agree on the terms with which to readmit the South into the Union. During the war, Congress passed several measures that nationalized the economy and greatly benefited Northern industrialists. But many worried that if the South were readmitted, many of these measures would be undone. Conservative Republicans felt that the South should be readmitted with the only caveat that the South accept the abolition of slavery. Radical Republicans like Charles, I got nearly beaten to death because I might have gone a little too far in ridiculing the South during a speech, Sumner, would argue that because the South seceded and had kind of committed treason, military leaders of the Confederacy should be punished, soldiers who fought for the Confederacy be disenfranchised, which again means they lose the right to vote, those who supported the Confederacy should have their property confiscated and redistributed among the freedmen, and that freed African Americans should become full citizens with their rights protected, including the right to vote. Logically, a lot of these positions make a lot of sense to us today, but we have to remember that the United States was and is a very racist country, and racism defies logic. Between the radical and conservative Republicans, you had moderate Republicans, which is where President Lincoln stood. Lincoln advocated for preserving the Union above all else, and therefore sided with more conservatives, as he believed it would allow for quick healing for the nation. As early as 1863, over a year before the end of the war, Lincoln announced his 10% plan, which would give amnesty to Southern whites who pledged loyalty to the government and accepted the abolition of slavery. High-ranking Confederates would not be given this opportunity. As soon as 10% of a state's 1860 voting population made the pledge, they could then establish a recognized state government. Lincoln also wanted to expand voting rights to African Americans if they were educated, owned property, and fought for the Union Army. Army. Notice that Southern whites who fought against the United States had none of these requirements under Lincoln's plan. Radical Republicans were outraged by this plan. They would block electoral votes of newly reconstructed states that had been reconstructed by the 1864 election. They would also persuade Congress to pass the Wade Davis bill. Under this proposed law, the president would have the authority to appoint a governor for a reconstructed state. In order to be readmitted to the Union, a formerly rebellious state would need a majority of its white male citizens to take the Pledge of Loyalty, also known as the Ironclad Oath, rather than the 10% of the white male population, which was the Lincoln Plan. 
The state would also have to disenfranchise Confederate leaders, abolish slavery, and cancel all debts related to the war. Meaning, if you bought a bunch of Confederate war bonds, sorry, Charlie, but the government doesn't owe you squat. Congress would pass the law a few days before it adjourned, but Lincoln would pull the old pocket veto maneuver in which he just sort of does nothing with the proposed law, and once the Congress adjourns, the law is vetoed and essentially dead because the radical Republicans didn't have enough votes to override it. Would Lincoln have reasoned with the radical Republicans? Would have he attempted to ensure some of their demands for reparations and enfranchisement for blacks? Would Lincoln's beard have turned a cool pattern of gray as he got older? Sadly, none of those questions would be answered as Lincoln was shot in the back of his head on April 14, 1865, as he and his wife were watching a production of Tom Taylor's farcical romp, Our American Cousin, at Ford's Theater. It was a play that was wildly popular with the public, but received mixed reviews from critics, including its lead actor, Joseph Jefferson, who admitted that it had little literary merit. Joey Jefferson was a treasure of 19th century theater, and that is a fact. The man who shot Lincoln was a very famous actor at the time by the name of John Wilkes Booth, who had fanatical Southern sympathies. Lincoln would be taken to a house across the street where he would be pronounced dead the next morning. While the assassination occurred the night before, Booth had planned with the help of co-conspirators to assassinate Secretary of State William Seward and Vice President Andrew Johnson. Johnson's assassination attempt failed as his assassin chickened out at the last minute. Seward's assassination attempt failed as his assassin's gun didn't work. He tried to then stab Seward to death as he was bedridden at the time from a horse carriage accident. Seward's family and servants eventually overpowered his assassin and drove him away. Seward suffered serious injuries, but he did recover. Booth escaped to Virginia after he killed President Lincoln. He would be cornered by Union troops in a Virginia barn and shot to death as the barn burned all around him. A military tribunal would convict eight other people as co-conspirators, a few on virtually no evidence. Four of them would be hanged. After Lincoln's assassination, radical Republicans grew more militant and the chance at peace seemed severely threatened. The future of Reconstruction and the nation itself were now largely in the incompetent hands of President Andrew Johnson. Johnson was a petty, racist, and insecure man who was openly hostile to free African Americans and didn't want to offer them much of any help. He would say that white men alone should manage the South. He would reveal a plan for restoration, which was what he preferred to call reconstruction. Note the difference in words and why he would choose restoration and what that shows about the sort of person he was. His plan was actually much like the Wade Davis bill. He gave amnesty to Southerners who took an oath and would consider on a case-by-case -case basis any Confederate leader or Southerner who had more than $20,000 in wealth. Supposedly, he did this because as a self-made man from Tennessee, he wanted to see Southern aristocrats have to beg him. He kind of grew up poor, and so the idea of seeing very rich Southerners have to beg him for amnesty was something that he really wanted to do. Johnson would help create a path for white Southerners to return to their lands. He gave no help to freed African Americans, many of whom would find themselves living again as basically slaves on plantations. By 1865, all the seceded states founded new governments with some under Lincoln's plan and some under Johnson's plan. To radical Republicans, the South was seen as far too reluctant to abolish slavery as well as their refusal to entertain the idea of granting suffrage to blacks. Republicans would also be outraged as the South would elect many Confederate leaders to positions of government. Essentially, the South was trying to weasel its way back to life before the war. Which brings us to a discussion on the era known as Radical Reconstruction. Now here's the thing about the adjective radical. When used to describe a political viewpoint or policy, it's usually meant as a bad thing. This is a stark contrast to how Taft described the sick Maradona I pulled on him during our soccer training session the other day.
radical is usually used to imply that someone is way far left to the point of being extreme, perhaps unrealistically or dangerously extreme. As I describe what radical Republicans wanted, I want you to determine for yourself whether these policies were within reason for the United States, or were they too crazy, too extreme, too radical? Radical Reconstruction started when Congress refused to seat the representatives that emerged from Johnson's policy of restoration. Congress would form a Joint Committee on Reconstruction and adopt a Reconstruction policy of their own. Events in the South would steer the course for this policy as Southern state legislatures began to adopt sets of laws that would become known as Black Codes. Black codes, if you couldn't tell already by their name, were heavily unjust towards black people as they were designed to give whites greater control over people that were still seen as nothing more than ex-slaves to the South. For the most part, the laws would prohibit vagrancy, which basically means being unemployed. Black codes would authorize the police to arrest unemployed African Americans, fine them for vagrancy, and then hire them out to local plantation owners to pay off their debt. Black codes would also forbid blacks from owning property or being able to work in any job other than plantation worker or domestic servant. Black codes were nothing more than blatant attempts to reinstill slavery without calling it slavery. Well, the radical Congress went a little radical and crazy and decided that black codes were racist and unjust and passed a law that would extend the Freedmen's Bureau as well as a Civil Rights Act which would establish African Americans as citizens of the United States. These acts would allow the federal government to intervene when state and local governments unjustly took rights away from African Americans. And again, this is labeled as radical. But maybe they thought this reconstruction was actually... Radical. What do you think, Taft? Is it radical to protect the rights of African Americans, or is it radical, bro? Well, Andrew Johnson didn't think it was very rad, because he vetoed these measures. Congress had the votes to override that veto, which is a pretty rad thing to do. Speaking of rad, let's talk about the passage of the 14th Amendment, which is easily one of the most rad amendments we have in our Constitution. When it was passed in 1866, it was also considered by many to be radical, the bad kind of radical. The 14th Amendment laid out the rules for citizenship and established that any person born in the United States and everyone naturalized, which means you became a citizen through the legal process, were entitled to all privileges and immunities guaranteed to all citizens. Any restriction based on race was illegal. The amendment also would impose penalties on states if they restricted males the right to vote. Women were still not allowed to vote at this time, which was not very radical. Congress would propose that southern states be readmitted to the Union if they accepted the 14th Amendment, but only Tennessee would do so. Much of the rest of the South would erupt in race riots, which would boost radical Republicans in Congress as the Republican majority would grow tremendously after elections. With an overwhelming majority, Congress had a degree of power rarely seen in American history. They would pass three Reconstruction bills, all of which were vetoed by Andrew Johnson, and all three vetoes would be overridden by the Congress, which is kind of unheard of. The bills would split the South into five military districts, which would be led by military commanders under the command of General Ulysses S. Grant. Their orders were to register all qualified adult males, which were African American males and males who who had not participated in the rebellion. The states were then to establish constitutional conventions, incorporate the 14th Amendment, and ensure protection for black citizenship and voting rights in order to be readmitted as states. By 1868, Arkansas, North Carolina, South Carolina, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida would be readmitted. Texas and Virginia were delayed by conservative whites, but when they did apply for statehood in 1870, a new amendment had been passed, the 15th Amendment. This amendment would guarantee voting rights to all adult male citizens and would protect their voting rights regardless of race, color, or previous enslavement. The radical Republicans would also enact the Tenure of Office Act that would limit the president's ability to change the military or his cabinet without Senate approval. This was to ensure that the military would not be changed by Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was seen as an obstruction to a lot of the aims of radical Republicans as he wanted to undo a lot of what they were trying to do. 
Congress would pass a similar law to limit interference from the Supreme Court as well. The radicals wanted Johnson out of the picture via impeachment. They saw their chance when Johnson violated the Tenure of Office Act when he removed Secretary of War Edwin Stanton from office. The House quickly impeached Johnson for violating the act, and the case went to the Senate for trial. But by this time, many moderate Republicans in the Senate began to lose faith in the radical Republicans. Seven moderates would side with the few Democrats in the Senate. There were not enough votes to remove Johnson from office, and he was thusly acquitted. As one can imagine, the South hated Reconstruction. Whites would claim that the Reconstruction governments were incompetent and corrupt and would cause large amounts of death and would trample upon the rights of white citizens. Again, we have to remember that most white citizens wanted the right to exploit black people in pseudo-slave systems, so they were probably right in saying Reconstruction trampled those rights, but their right to do what? To be free or to be free to oppress people? But many Southern blacks would also criticize Reconstruction, saying that it didn't do enough to protect their rights as free American citizens. The Republican-controlled state governments of the South would be heavily criticized by Southerners for generations to come. Southerners would call the Southern white Republicans scalawags. These were men who believed that the Republican Party would do more to economically develop the region than the Democrats. Democrats would accuse Scalawags of betraying their race. In addition to Scalawags, Southerners also hated carpetbaggers. These were predominantly middle-class men from the North who came to the South to try to establish business ventures as the South recovered from the Civil War. They were called carpetbaggers because some of them carried suitcases made of carpet material. Quite the insult at the time. Hey Taft, you're a carpetbagger. Sheesh, Louise Taft. That wasn't very rad of you to say. But most Southern Republicans were black freedmen. For obvious reasons, most black freedmen had no political experience, but would make concerted efforts to build political institutions to ensure their rights would be honored. Blacks would hold almost every position of public office, with the exception of governor and obviously president at that time. They would serve in state legislatures as well as the House of Representatives and the Senate. But the Reconstruction governments would be criticized as corrupt and expensive. Expensive. They would spend far more tax dollars than previous southern governments, mostly because antebellum governments never really spent much money at all. But public schools, railroads, public aid programs, and public works projects all cost money, and this freaked out southerners. And to be fair, there was a pretty good deal of corruption in Reconstruction governments. But there was also corruption in northern governments, and corruption would continue after Reconstruction ended. But perhaps the great accomplishment of Reconstruction Construction was what it did to improve Southern education. Before, the South was last compared to the West and the North in terms of literacy and kids enrolled in school. But with the pushing of reform for instruction, as well as a great deal of money donated from Northern philanthropists, Freedmen's schools would pop up all over the South. Nearly 4,000 schools would be built by this network, staffed by nearly 9,000 teachers, half of whom were black. 200,000 students would be taught at these schools, making up nearly 12% of the population of freed black children. By 1876, nearly half of white children and 40% of black children received an education. Opportunities for higher education would emerge as well, as the first academies would emerge to offer African Americans opportunities at higher education. Eventually, these academies would become the first historically all-black universities, like Fisk University, Atlanta University, and Morehouse. But schools would be segregated. White parents would refuse to enroll their children in freedmen's schools. Early attempts to integrate schools were abject failures. As 1875, civil rights acts attempted to integrate schools via legislation, but the integration component was removed before these bills were even taken to a vote. Not until 1955 would segregated schools be challenged in the court of law. But the most ambitious plan of the radical Republicans was the effort of land redistribution. Early on after the Civil War, the Freedmen's Bureau redistributed land owned by plantation owners who had abandoned the land during the war. Nearly 10,000 black families would receive land from the government and many blacks began to hope for their own prospect of 40 acres and a mule, which was an idea derived from an order by William Tecumseh Sherman as he tried to grant a few freed families land for during his 
famous march in the waning days of the Civil War. But land redistribution would fail as whites would return to their plantations and would have their land given back to them as ordered by Andrew Johnson. Many Republicans believed they didn't have the right to confiscate land from the South. Regardless, land ownership among blacks rose considerably, even though among whites it declined at that time. But unfortunately, due to bank failures and hard luck, many would lose their land by 1890. A new system of labor would emerge that would become very similar to the antebellum system of slavery, sharecropping. Under this system, a family, usually a black family, but white family sharecropped too, would rent a piece of land from a landlord where they would raise crops and pay rent or a percentage of crops to the landlord. The work was very similar to the work performed under slavery, but with freedom being the key difference. But the southern economy would also suffer due to a new system of credit known as the crop lien system. Before the war, most banking and credit in the south was done by cotton brokers known as factors. After the war, most of those factors were gone, and credit was usually offered in local country stores. But since these stores had very little competition, they could offer loans at absurd interest rates like 50 or 60 percent, and small farmers had no other alternatives. And farmers needed loans to pay for things, considering that the nature of farm work means that your money only comes a few times a year whenever the harvests go. That lean part comes in through collateral. In case you don't know what collateral is, it's something you offer to give up in case you can't pay a loan. A lot of times people offer their house as collateral for a big loan. The only collateral small farms could offer was a hefty percentage of their crops. Because of massive interest rates, as well as the up and down nature of farming, small farmers couldn't pay their loans, so they would naturally then owe the liens on their crops. But this would create a vicious cycle of debt, causing scores of small farmers to lose their land to predatory loan systems like crop liens. This would also cause the South to remain entrenched in a one-dimensional agricultural economy of cotton production, as cotton was still the most profitable thing to grow, despite the fact that it was losing value on the global market, as other sources of cotton would emerge throughout the world. So you had a bunch of broken, indebted farmers, usually only growing one crop that was losing value and also exhausting the soil at the same time. The South was slowly destroying its agricultural economy. As African Americans began to adjust to their newly earned freedom, one of their first priorities was to establish or reestablish their families. Blacks would look tirelessly for family members, and black newspapers would be filled with advertisements from people looking for relatives who had been displaced during the era of slavery. As the era of Reconstruction wore on, blacks would attempt to establish gender roles within the family that were similar to white families at the time. Men would work in the fields, and women would stay at home to fulfill domestic duties, or at least that's what the plan was. African Americans would adopt an attitude that women working in the field was a mark of slavery and would thus need to be avoided. But due to the many obstacles American society put in place to keep blacks from attaining financial stability, many African American women would be forced to take on work to help support their families. Women would work the fields, take in laundry, or take on domestic service jobs. In many ways, African American women were taking on many of the same jobs white women and immigrant women of the North were taking, but the key difference being that most working African American women were married with children. By the end of Reconstruction, nearly half of African American females over the age of six years old were working full-time. Which brings us to the Grant administration. Hey Taft, guess who was president during the Grant administration? No, not Hugh Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, silly beast. After the chaos of the Johnson presidency, Americans wanted stability in their president and figured they'd find it in Civil War hero Ulysses S. Grant. Grant could have had the nomination of either the Democrats or Republicans. That's how popular he was. But he chose the Republicans because he agreed more with their politics and they had a better chance to win. He would choose wisely as he narrowly beat Democratic opponent Horatio Seymour, thanks in large part to the black vote. Grant had no political experience and it showed. His administration was clumsy and many of his appointments were ill-prepared for their job. Grant would mostly appoint people he felt were loyal to him, which was probably a military thing, and many would suspect, somewhat rightfully so, that corruption was rampant in Grant's administration. 
He would also support many of the radical Republican policies, which would further alienate many members of the party to such a degree that they would form a new group called the Liberal Republicans. The Democrats would align themselves with the Liberal Republicans and try to defeat Grant in 1872 with newspaper editor Horace Greeley as their nominee. It didn't work as Greeley got whooped by Grant, 286 electoral votes to 66. But the accusations of scandal in Grant's administration proved to be more truth than rumor. First, it was the Credit Mobilier scandal. Executives from the Union Pacific Railroad Company had this idea on how to scam a bunch of money from the government. Their idea was to make up a construction company, give it a fancy French name of Credit Mobilier, put themselves in charge of it, and since the government was paying for it, they could overcharge all of their construction costs and keep the money that they weren't using. They would then bribe congressional Republicans with stocks in the company to prevent investigations. It didn't work because they got investigated anyway in 1872 and got caught. Nearly a third of congressional Republicans would be voted out of office as a result of the scandal, including Vice President Schuyler Colfax, who would see his political career ruined. In addition to this scandal, Grant also had the Whiskey Ring scandal as well as the Indian Ring scandal. The Whiskey Ring scandal involved members of the Treasury Secretary's office who were running a secret whiskey production operation and were also cheating on their taxes. The Indian Ring scandal involved William Belknap, the Secretary of War, who was accepting bribes to keep an Indian trader post in office. Public faith in Grant and the federal government would be irreparably weakened. And as if a corruption scandal wasn't enough, Grant also had to deal with a financial crisis. It started when a large investment banking firm went broke, investing too much in railroads, which would cause a crisis in faith in the economy, which means people stop spending money, stop issuing loans, people go broke, debts don't get paid, and the economy is wrecked. You know, depression stuff, Taft. It is pretty depressing. The Panic of 1873 would prove to be a doozy as it would last for four years. To try and stop the economic depression, some suggested issuing more currency. But banks hated that idea as it would inflate currency, which would hurt their profit margin. To keep banks and creditors happy, creditors are people who have money owed to them, you know, like a bank. The Grant administration, with help from Republican leaders in Congress, would pass the Specie Resumption Act. Basically, it meant that the old Civil War greenbacks would be rendered useless after January 1st, 1879. And if you had any greenbacks, you had to exchange them for a new currency that was backed by gold rather than faith in the government. This would inspire a new political party based on the idea that controlled currency inflation was actually a good thing which it kind of is because a little inflation generally means your economy is growing. A lot of inflation is bad, but a little inflation is good. The party had some influence in the following three presidential elections, but never really was able to become a force in the country. But the crowning achievement of Grant and Johnson would come in their management of foreign affairs. Bear in mind the achievements are not really from the efforts of President Grant or Johnson themselves, but their highly capable secretaries of state. In William, I got stabbed in the face but still managed to make great strides in changing the face of the nation, Seward, and Hamilton Fish. He probably was. Seward was able to purchase Alaska from Russia for $7.2 million. People at the time would criticize this move as they thought Alaska was nothing but ice and seals and Eskimos and polar bears, which I think is actually pretty valuable, but that's just me. But Alaska actually has a ton of resources that are vital to the United States. People would call this purchase Seward's folly, but time would prove that criticism to be erroneous. Grant Secretary of State Hamilton Fish after several failed attempts, was able to get England to apologize for allowing Confederate ships, including the Alabama, to be constructed in their shipyards during the Civil War. England would also compensate the United States for the damages caused by these ships with a $15.5 million payment, which is a pretty nice chunk of change at that time, Taft. 
But the potential to reconstruct a nation of racial equality was abandoned in the South as Northern leadership, occupied with political scandal and economic depression, lost their interest in energy in maintaining Reconstruction. Southern Democrats were able to regain power in the South as Republicans were unable to hold political control over the region. The South would claim it had redeemed control over itself. In the northern part of the South, regaining control was simple, as whites constituted a majority, so they were able to win elections for the Democratic Party. In the more southern states of the South, African Americans were the majority in some states, or they were equal in numbers to whites. To win elections here, southern whites would engage in brutal acts of oppression upon blacks that would stifle nearly all aspects of one's life. Widespread use of terrorist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan would intimidate blacks from engaging in politics through acts of horrific violence and intimidation. The Klan emerged as a mean for whites to regain control of the South, often led by former Civil War Confederate leaders like Nathan Bedford Forrest. The Klan divides a secret society involving secret rituals, costumes, and orchestrated acts of terrorism committed against blacks, often in the middle of the night. During elections, other groups like the Red Shirts and White Leagues would police polling places to intimidate blacks from voting. These groups, like the Klan, would be seen by whites as political freedom fighters who were fighting for the rights of white Southerners to continue to live in a society in which they were free to reap the benefits of oppressing and exploiting black people. The Klan would be supported by whites from all ends of the socioeconomic spectrum, especially those who were wealthy and politically connected and wish to gain more wealth and control. Aside from terrorist groups like the Klan, white Southern society would also use up economic measures to oppress blacks who were politically active. To discourage blacks from voting Republican or at all, Southern whites would refuse to give them lines of credit, would refuse to hire them, and would refuse to rent homes and apartments to blacks who voted Republican. To try and stop the Klan, the Republican Congress would pass the Enforcement Acts in 1870 and 1871. Also known as the Klan Acts, these laws would allow the federal government to step in and override the states when they were found to be repressing the voting rights of black people. This actually occurred in South Carolina under the Grant administration as hundreds of suspected Klan members were arrested by federal authorities, some of which would be eventually convicted and sent to jail. But these acts were seldomly used outside of this instance in South Carolina. Regardless, these acts, along with efforts from blacks as well as whites to weaken the Klan, were effective as the Klan was in decline all over the South by 1872, for the moment. But as is often the case with reform movements, the pendulum swung back away from the efforts at reform and more towards conservative measures. The radical Republicans got old and became less radical, as is often the case. When you get older, you get a little less radical. Right there. Mm -hmm. With the passage of the 15th Amendment, many Republicans felt that they had done enough for freedmen in the South and that they should be able to take care of themselves. Many in the North began to accept the theory of social Darwinism, which is basically a theory based on bogus science that some people are fit for success in life and some are not. As you can imagine, this was based heavily on racism and perpetuated the idea that essentially whites were more fit for success than blacks and therefore efforts to help blacks were in vain. Basically, radical Republicans were tired of trying to help blacks and were confused and frustrated as to why they couldn't fix over 250 years of racism and oppression in seven years. Programs to aid freedmen ceased. Democrats gained huge control over large parts of the South thanks to corruption scandals within the Republican Party, as well as terrorist acts of voter suppression for the South. In states like Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, where terrorism was apparent, Republicans would challenge the result of elections and would remain in office thanks to the presence of federal troops. However, it was clear that without a military presence, any and all Republican regimes in the South would fall. The final nail in the coffin of Reconstruction was the Compromise of 1877. The Compromise swirled around the election of 1876, an election whose inconclusive result would make the 2020 election look like an easy open and shut case. 
Grant wouldn't run for another term because he had scandals, there was the failure of reconstruction, and his poor health all made it seem like his candidacy would be a loser. The election would pit Republican Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio against Democrat Samuel Tilden of New York. Both were moderate reformers who actually had many similarities in terms of their politics, but the race was extremely tight, with Tilden narrowly winning by one electoral vote. However, the ballots from Oregon, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida were disputed and people could not agree as to whether to allow them or not. A special electoral commission was made up of Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, who were actually Republicans. Shh, don't tell anyone. They weren't actually Independent. Don't tell anyone daft. You would. The commission would agree to make Hayes president, but the South would only accept this under certain conditions. Hayes had to stick to his commitment to remove federal troops from the South, he had to include Southerners in his cabinet, and he had to give generous aid to assist in Southern internal improvements. The compromise was set and Hayes was set to become president. Unfortunately for Hayes, his presidency was a disaster from the start, as many would refer to him as his fraudulency. Republicans would fail to keep control in the South as Southern whites, who liked Republican economic policies of internal improvements, hated Republicans for their corruption, even though Southern Democrats were just as corrupt. And more than anything else, Southerners hated Republicans for infringing on their freedom to construct a society that subjugated and exploited African Americans at every level. Reconstruction was officially dead. Reconstruction is often regarded as one of the greatest failures in American history, and in many ways it was. Here was a chance for the United States to rebuild the South in a way that would mitigate the damaging impact of racism. But we must remember that Reconstruction reformers were limited by the Constitution as to what they could do, were limited by a prevailing attitude towards the respect of private property, and above all else, were limited by their own prevailing racist attitudes. People at that time would not have enough fortitude or understanding to take the necessary steps to undo over 250 years of slavery and racism. A society with such a strong foundation of oppression and hatred was too difficult to dislodge at that time. The silver lining to Reconstruction's failure, though, was the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments, which would prove to be immeasurably important as the fight for the rights of African Americans would reemerge nearly 80 years later. As the last federal troops left the South in 1877, many in the South rejoiced as they claimed they had redeemed control. Southern white Democrats would regain control and thought they would claim that home rule had once again taken control. However, in reality, it was yet another wealthy and exclusive Southern oligarchy that would rule over the South, just as it had before the Civil War. This group would call themselves Redeemers, but others would majority call them Bourbons, which was the name of the wealthy European aristocratic family that once ruled over France, Spain, and Italy. The Redeemers or Bourbons would rule as many governments did at this time with a great deal of corruption. They would pilfer money collected in taxes and cut spending for public goods like education. One governor of Virginia would state that schools are not a necessity. Some movements would emerge to challenge the Bourbons, most notably the Readjuster Challenge. Readjusters were Southern whites with less money than the Bourbons who expressed concern regarding Bourbon corruption and their unwillingness to provide public benefit through aid. In 1879, Readjusters were able to win key victories in the state of Virginia as they gained a governorship and a Senate seat. But by the mid-1880s, conservative Southerners were able to use racial prejudice to destroy dissenting movements. Basically, they would claim dissenters like the readjusters wanted to take power away from whites for themselves and also worked for blacks, which of course worked well for the very racist late 19th century South. But change would come to the South to a degree as the nation was able to engage in industrial reform. Writers like Henry Grady of the Atlanta Constitution would boast that the South had reformed itself to become a region in which industrial virtues like thrift, innovation, hard work, and progress were paramount in the society. 
But as Grady was boasting of this new South, Southern culture was still stuck in the past as literature and the popularity of minstrel shows would idealize antebellum Southern society. Thanks in large part to the investment from the North, the South was able to dramatically improve their steel manufacturing as well as their railroad development. Despite the massive amounts of growth, by the turn of the century, the South still only produced a fraction of the manufactured goods the North was able to produce, had barely gotten productivity levels back to what they were in 1860 before the Civil War, and were still largely a colony region for Northern industrialists. Wealthy Northern capitalists would relish the opportunity to hire Southern workers because, since they were often so desperate for work, they only had to be paid half of what a worker in the North would be paid. On the topic of labor, the South still engaged in large amounts of slave labor, but in a sneaky way. Industrialization would occur largely thanks to the labor of prisoners or convicts. These men would be leased by state penitentiaries to private companies to do work which was often brutal and dangerous. And most of these convicts were black, as black codes would land African Americans in jail for crimes like vagrancy, which usually was just the crime of being unemployed. Blacks were often thrown in jail also under false pretenses by racist law enforcement and racist courts. With convict lease systems, we see a re-emergence of slave labor as the wages for labor would go to the state rather than the convict workers. Which brings us to the issue of how labor functioned in the still heavily agrarian South. Despite massive increases in industry, the South was still primarily based in farming cash crops like cotton and tobacco. However, because wealth and land ownership was in the hands of a very rich and privileged minority, most Southerners, especially blacks, didn't own the land, livestock, or tools necessary for farming. Most Southerners lived on land as tenants. If a farmer was fortunate enough to own his own tools and farm animals, Animals, he lived as a tenant and had to pay rent to the landlord. But if a farmer owned no tools or animals, he often lived as a sharecropper. A sharecropper was given a crude house and used the landlord's tools and farm animals and worked the farm accordingly. He would then have to pay a huge sum of any money he earned from growing and selling his crops to the landlord, and any earnings left over would be ideally used by the sharecropper to buy his own tools, livestock, or land. However, sharecroppers almost never had any money left over once they paid the landlord and usually found themselves in greater debt and thus tied to the land for kind of forever. And the idea of the New South would also be adopted by African Americans. A few African Americans were able to attain relatively comfortable middle class lives and some even attained large amounts of wealth through opening successful banks and insurance companies catered for black people. However, most of the black middle class was made up of professionals like teachers, doctors, lawyers, and nurses. Educational opportunities would become important within the black community as leaders like Booker T. Washington would express the importance of industrial education. Washington was a former slave who escaped poverty through education. He would become the founder of the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, where black students would learn practical work skills for jobs in industry and agriculture. Though he did a great deal to uplift African Americans economically, Washington would be heavily criticized as he is seen as presenting a movement for black empowerment that was by nature subservient to whites and therefore more acceptable to the white supremacist society of the United States. He would advocate that his students dress, speak, behave, and discipline themselves like a white middle class person. He would also tell his students to stay quiet on the issues of social equality. In a philosophy known as the Atlanta Compromise, Washington contended that direct action for social justice would damage African American standing and that the only way to gain respect is to prove one's worth as an economic asset to the country. Though Washington did a fine job instilling the value of education within the African American community, his critics would contend that he sold out his race because he advocated that his students accept white supremacy, which he did. But the idea of the New South did not extend to ideas regarding racial equality. After the removal of federal troops in 1877, after the Congress lost interest, the South began to look for new ways to instill a society in which a strict, 
racial hierarchy would be established. In the so-called civil rights cases of 1883, the Supreme Court determined that though the 14th Amendment prohibited state governments from discrimination, it did not prevent private citizens from doing so. This would mean railroads, hotels, theaters, and workplaces could legally practice segregation. In the case of Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, the practice of segregation would be put into law. The case involved a Louisiana train company having separate seating arrangements for black and white passengers. The court determined that discrimination did not exist if separate but equal arrangements were made for different races. However, the legal basis for segregated schools would undermine the equal part of separate but equal. In the case of Cumming v. County Board of Education, in this case, the court ruled that establishing separate schools for whites were still valid even if there were no black schools in the same area. In effect, this case made separate but unequal a legal practice in terms of education. Whites would also work to restrict the black right to vote almost as soon as they had gained it with the passage of the 15th Amendment. Southern state governments would pass certain voting laws that were intended to severely limit a black person's ability to cast a vote. Poll taxes would often require a person to pay a fee or prove they owned property before they could vote, something most blacks could not do. Literacy tests would be given to blacks, which were sometimes impossible to pass, even if one was literate. A separate test would be given to whites that was much easier. A grandfather law would be established which would allow a person to bypass the poll tax or literacy tests if their grandfather had voted. This, of course, would exclude blacks as none of their grandfathers voted because they were slaves and slaves weren't allowed to vote. By the early 20th centuries, laws that segregated schools and kept blacks from the ballot box would become part of a larger network of rampant, systemic racist laws, statutes, and customs known as the Jim Crow laws. These laws pervaded all aspects of life as education, housing, employment, health care, recreation, transportation, and relationships would all be effectively segregated. Segregation laws were easier to enforce in the countryside as interactions between races or much of anybody was far less frequent than in the more urban areas. In addition to laws that were designed to subjugate and exploit black people, horrific violence against blacks was also employed in the form of lynching. When a person is lynched, that means they are hanged and usually brutally tortured and mutilated beforehand. In the 1890s, the United States averaged 187 lynchings a year, almost 80% of them in the South. The victims are often people seen as threats to the community, people accused of some sort of crime, or people who were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Lynch mobs would especially go after black men who were accused of making sexual advances towards white women. We see this intense fear of black male sexuality within the American white community as vigilantes would rush to apprehend and lynch any black male who was even remotely suspected of attempting to make a pass at a white woman. Mind you, nothing was done to white men who made sexual advances on black women. Only black men who made sexual advances on white women. Lynchings would be a means of social control via terror. It was a coordinated violent attack designed to try and keep black people subordinate and to ensure that racial mixing did not occur. The rise of lynchings did shock and horrify many white Americans at the time. Thanks in large part to the efforts of a committed black journalist, Ida B. Wells, an international anti-lynching movement would spread rapidly as she wrote about the lynching of three of her friends in her hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. Her friends were lynched because they dared to open a black-owned grocery store within a black community that threatened the business of a white-owned grocery store that had already existed. Her movement gained massive popularity and intense support from white women in the North. Their goal was to pressure the federal government to pass a law that would ensure those who committed these murders would be punished as Southern law enforcement usually either turned a blind eye or supported the efforts of lynch mobs. And here we see the power of white unity for the cause of white supremacy. Even as poor whites were getting exploited by bourbon oligarchs in the South, they still would place white supremacy as more important than class consciousness. For over 300 years, from Bacon's Rebellion in the late 18th century to Jim Crow in the early 20th century, we see the plot of wealthy Americans to divide and conquer the lower classes through systemic racism not only still in use, 
but stronger than ever. Thank you guys for watching. We'll pick it up next week as we look at the movement towards the West. On behalf of William Howard Taft and myself, thank you all so much for watching. And don't forget, we got to keep pushing, G. Thank <laughs> you.